Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Google Apps for Education um, Next Practice Literacy um, webinar. I am your host for this evening. My name is Chris Hart, and I work at John Monash Science School, and I'm very um, privileged to be a Google Certified Innovator um, and the host of this series of Next Practice um, webinars. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to sit back a little bit and enjoy this evening's um, webinar with our guest presenter. Greg O'Connor from uh, Text Help. I'm, I'm sure Greg's going to introduce himself in a little bit more detail when he comes on. Um, just a quick reminder that if you have not registered, please do so. Um, it's, it's really important that you register so that we can send you the um, links and things and also the links to Greg's presentation and a handout. So please, if you haven't registered, make sure you do register. You can find the registrations at www.uldtraining.com forward slash webinars. And I'll remind you of that towards the end of this webinar as well. Um, as I say, very, very excited for, um, for this webinar tonight around literacy and what technology can do to support uh, literacy and learning. Um, just a reminder that you do have the Q&A app on the top right-hand corner of your screen. So if you do have any questions, please click on the Q&A app. And I will try and politely or rudely interrupt Greg at certain points uh, to ask him the questions that you guys are posing. Also, don't forget that in the bottom of the Hangout, you will be able to um, click on the thumbs up or the thumbs down button. So if Greg says something amazing, which you really love, um, click on that thumbs up button. And then if he says something terrible, which you hate, which I'm sure will not be the case, you can even click on the thumbs down button. And that will mean that when you uh, look back at this recording, you can see the highlights. And of course, there won't be any low lights um, of Greg's presentation. So that's certainly enough for me. I'm going to pass over to Greg now. Um, and as I said, I will interrupt with some questions uh, now and again, so I will be speaking to you throughout the next hour, but I'll leave you in Greg's capable hands. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Chris, and hi, everybody. Uh, it is a great privilege to be here to, uh, to provide this webinar. What I'm going to do is uh, share my screen. Uh, do, do, do. Here we go. And you should be now seeing my, my, my screen, I hope. Good, thanks, Chris. And I'll just... Um, so th this webinar, um, I've titled Google Apps for Education, The Cloud Just Got Better for Students Struggling with Literacy. And as Chris said, this is, a, this is, GAIF. This is looking at GAIF and literacy. But in particular, I'm looking at those students who struggle with the everyday literacy needs of being in school. So those kids in, in, in upper primary and in secondary and beyond who actually just find school challenging because they struggle with reading and writing and just with being organised. Here's a work sample of a student that, um, an upper secondary student, and he, um, this is a writing sample, when all he was given was a pen and paper. He wasn't really given any other accommodations or adjustments and was given no real technology to support support his writing and I just thought it's a good way to start and you know what what could we give the student to support the student is obviously struggling to get so much out but just can't get it down on, on pen and paper. We know in Australian schools currently there are about 15 percent of all students actually do struggle with reading and writing in school and they're the kids we actually know about and and that that percentage could be a lot higher. We also know that in schools 25% of our students in Australia actually come from backgrounds where they have um, language backgrounds other than English. So we have a lot of kids in school who come every morning into your classroom who start from behind the, the, um, the behind because they actually struggle with this idea that they have to be able to read and write to get on in school. They're defined by their ability to read and write. Just looking at NAPLAN results, for instance, not that I would like to look at NAPLAN results, but if I did, I would notice that in year five across Australia, 11% of students are actually currently reading at the minimum national standard. 4% of kids are actually reading below the national minimum standard. You then get to year nine, that increases to 17% of students reading only at the minimum standard and 6% below. So what I'm kind of saying is, there's a lot of kids in our classrooms who struggle what can, we, what can we do for them using Google Apps for Education as one platform to support their literacy? Well, the thing that we have to do is we actually have to make it available. 
and the really cool thing about GAFE is that it's it's available, it's universal, it's there when students need it. You don't actually have to go to your special computer in, in your special classroom in a special corner to use your technology. It's there whenever you log in. It's universally available. It's available on your Chromebook, on your PC, on your Mac. It's wherever you need it. And that's that's the thing that I love about working in the GAFE environment. It's just made that universal access. Just It just makes it happen. So I'm going to look at a whole range of different tools that we could use to support our students and to support that student I showed you at the beginning with their work sample. Using things like text-to-speech, speech recognition, word prediction, a whole bunch of writing support tools, dictionaries, ed editing, summarising tools, study tools, study skills and organisational tools. Um, I won't go into any, any great depth in this webinar, but there is research and it's an emerging research, it's emerging peer review research that tells us that when we use lots of these tools, lots of these accommodations and literacy, we get increases in reading speed, in attention, in vocab, in comprehension and in writing. And in the handout you'll have, I'll have links to various research articles that um, will lead you down the path if you want to investigate that a bit further. But let's start, and let's start, and I thought what I, what I would do is actually just look at three aspects. I would look at reading, I would, I would explore cognitive load, in particular working memory, and how we can support students with that in their literacy, and then finally we, we would look at writing. So let's start with reading. And the very first thing I want to do is text-to-speech, and it's probably, for me, it's the most basic, but it's the one that's actually just there. Um, if I just leave my this for a moment and come back to my, my computer screen. Now I'm using a, I'm using a Mac um, and I'll just go to a document. I've got this, I've got a Google Doc on the screen that I'm using with, with students. Um, before I use any tool in, in GAFE, I'm using a Mac, but I could be using a PC, I could be using a Chromebook, I could be using a, a, a tablet, an iPad, um, an Android tablet. Every device that you have has text-to-speech built in. So if I come down here and just open up my settings, for instance, and my computer, I've got in my Mac, I've got a setting, I've got a, a preference, sorry, that's dictations and speech. And when I open that up, and I, I actually find I have text to speech. I can choose a voice, and I can choose a speaking rate, and I can also decide to have um, some, some keystrokes that I can use to activate this, and I've got option escape chosen. Just with that turned on, if I highlight some text on the screen without actually installing anything else, I'll now just press option escape on my keyboard. The largest land mammal on earth, the African elephant weighs up to eight tons. How cool is that? You, it's just sitting there on your device and it's on every device. Now, that's all it does. That's great, that's, that's an opening, but there are so many tools that we, that we, can, that we can get when we're actually using in the GAFE environment where we're in Google Chrome, using Google Chrome and, and, and in Google Drive using things like Google Docs, we can actually have a whole bunch of other tools we can use to support text-to-speech. One of those that I use, and um, over here on my, on my toolbar, you can see I've got a few of my extensions I'm currently using, and one of those that I'm using is, is called um, text-to-speech, if I just open up my list of extensions currently that I have, I just scroll down the bottom here and you can see I have a whole bunch. I've actually taken a lot off, but this one is called Speak It. Now I have Speak It uh, um, installed as an extension. So if I go back to here and I highlight that text, I press Speak It. Oops, now actually what I'll do, I'll just show, I'll go to a website that'll, that'll be better. Here's a website to show that it works there as well. Highlight some text and press speak it. Forward to 1110 and 9876543211234567891011111211315161. Just ignore that. I don't know what happened then, but basically it should actually read it out to me. I think I actually made a bit of a mistake somewhere, but it will read out the text to you just by doing a click. But that is often the issue too. You download an extension and it doesn't quite always do what you. I went to, maybe I went to the wrong, uh, I had an error on that page. So what, I, so what I'm looking for is a tool that actually know that's going to work. And one of the tools that I use, and I currently, in my current role, I've been um, teaching for now for about 30 years, and in my current role, uh, 
I've just started a new position with um, Textop, and Textop are a company that provide a range of literacy tools, including Read and Write for Google. And I've got Read and Write for Google installed on my uh, on my uh, in Google in my Google account. And sitting, if I go back to this document, and sitting um, as a toolbar now, I can click on my little purple icon, and it brings down my toolbar that I have available, and it has a text to speech button on my toolbar. I put my cursor at the beginning of the sentence and it will play it back for me. The largest land mammal on earth, the African elephant weighs up to eight tons. And the cool thing about that is that it also has highlighting as well. So it actually provides text to speech and highlighting so I can track the words as they're being read out aloud. It does also work on a web page, and I'll just go to this web page that I was having struggled with before. The problem with the web page is often you click on a on a on a word to read it out, but it could be a it could be a live link. So my read and write for Google toolbar is actually now housed up here. I just click on the little purple icon, and it brings up the toolbar for me. And there's the toolbar, and then I'm on a website. And this time I actually have a little hover tool I can use, hover speech. And rather than having to click on the text, I just need to hover over the text and it will read it back to me. The largest land mammal on earth, the African elephant weighs up to eight tons. So, just go Sorry, back. Greg, we've just got a quick question here from Rachel. So Rachel, oh. probably, thanks for your question. Um, and she asks, are these apps available for all languages? And I think Rachel is particularly interested in Welsh. Ah, well, I... Um, Various apps will have various, um, some of them will be available for multiple languages. I'm not too sure about Welsh, um, um, but not every no, not every app has multiple languages. For instance, if I was to go back to um, uh, this one and look at the settings that I've got for my voice, I've got um, a number of languages that are available Oops, back to here, that are available um, currently for, for translation and for reading back. So there's um, one of the issues with, with um, natural sounding voices, you actually have to, um, it has to be produced and not every voice is being, is being produced. Um, many though, if I go back to my, um, on my devices though, I know that on um, an iPad for instance, I have m many languages that are available. Um, and on my machine as well. So it depends on, on the tool that I'm using. And I've just checked on Speak It, the, the Chrome extension that you showed us before. It does say that it has Welsh. Can't guarantee that it's natural language. It might well be computerized language. So, it, you know. Yeah. It's and, and the way to find, sorry, Chris, the way to find that out on that uh, uh, Speak It um, I, uh, extension, if I just do a right hand click, I could bring up options. And it will actually show me. Um, what's available and, oops, and um, there, there are the voices there. And did you see Welsh there, Chris? Um, I can't. Maybe it's fibbing. It does say, it does say there are 50 voice, there are 50, 50 but um, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure about Welsh. Sorry about that, Rachel, maybe. It's certainly, it's certainly a request feature, I reckon. Um, I've, just, I've got another um, quick question for you, if that's okay, Greg, and it's about read and write. Is it free for everyone? Okay, so um, it, in terms of read and write for Google, it's actually free for teachers. And on the handout, there'll be a link that you can go to to download read and write for Google. Uh, everyone gets uh, access to a 30-day trial for read and write for Google. Um, then after 30 days, the premium, um, some of the features I will be looking in this webinar, I'll bring up, will uh, no longer function, but the text-to-speech and some of the basic elements uh, maintain in, in your toolbar, but then you actually have to subscribe to maintain the, to get the, the premium features from the, after the 30 days, except if you're a teacher. And if, as a teacher, you get actually access to a full premium version um, for a whole year and beyond. That's a big thumbs up from us. So we thanks for that, Barbara. We've also got, um, so Rachel is particularly interested in speech recognition apps, which is uh, great. And maybe we can do a bit more, there's a bit more research into Welsh. But um, Claire has also said that she's really enjoying using Read and Write with her current learners. So that's great to hear, Claire. Oh, thanks, Claire. It's, it's fantastic. That's, that's all my questions for now, mate. So I'll pass back to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, so, so there's a whole bunch. There, and there's lots of other um, um, text-to-speech apps I, 
I could show, but I but that, that, that you just need to go into the Chrome store and type in text to speech, and you'll get a whole a whole bunch of um, extensions that will be available to you. The 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 um, just scroll down here. The thing about text to speech is is we this one consideration that we need we need to consider is, is that when we read we read up to an expert reader reads up between four hundred to five hundred words per minute. Um, when we speak, we speak at about one hundred and fifty to one hundred and seventy words per minute. Now, what happens is when you use text to speech and, you, and you're having the text on the screen read aloud to you, which is such a fantastic, it's a, such a, a, it can change a young person's life to get access to, to the information that's on their screen. But we have to consider um, at what speed it's read out. We know that when students actually read, in, in, if they read below 100 words per minute, they have there are comprehension problems because you're so focused on decoding, you're reading at such a slow rate that you can't comprehend, you don't get the total picture of what you're reading. So we have to make sure whatever we use, we're actually, my rule of thumb is that I get my text to speech on my device reading at the, at the same rate as, as people would normally speak at, somewhere between 150 to 170 um, words per minute. So speaking of comprehension, it, comprehension is an issue for, for lots, of our, lots of our students. You know, it's one thing to turn on text to speech and have, have it read back to you, but am I understanding what's being read? In? And, 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 and is it matching my vocab and, and do I, am I getting information from the screen or am I just getting a whole bunch of audio, audio coming at me? So one of the things that I, that I do, if I go back to my, um, my example here and I've, and I've got the student and I get uh, lots of the students that I work with, I'll get them to, to read, a, read a sentence using text-to-speech. The elephant is distinguished by its massive body, large ears and a long trunk, which has many uses ranging from using it as a hand to pick up objects, as a horn to trumpet warnings, an arm raised in greeting to a hose. And, and, the reader, and what I get to do is, at the end of a sentence, they'll just kind of go back and say, were there any words in that, in that sentence that were just read, uh, just read out that I don't understand? And, and I might get them to highlight, using the highlight tool, a couple of the words that they actually know that I didn't quite understand what those words mean. I need, I need to now go back and actually um, look at that vocab and actually explore more. And there's a couple of things you can do. I've got a um, Google Dictionary is an extension that, um, that uh, you can get. And if I go, let's go back to the web page here. And if I um, click on Trumpet and open up, I'll just get rid of my toolbar there for a moment, and open up my Google Dictionary extension it automatically looks for me looks and actually finds the definition for that word and that's fantastic i can also um have that coming up by double clicking actually in the on the web page itself and i'll get that definition coming up one of the problems i have is often the definition that comes up i can't quite get that read back to me and i actually need the definition read as well and i guess that's where it's something like um Read and write for Google. It also has a definition, a dictionary. Sorry, and I'll just go back to Trumpet. And if I press on the dictionary in Read and Write for Google on the on the toolbar, it comes up. It provides me the definition, but it also gives me text to speech as well. A brass musical instrument with a brilliant tone has a narrow tube and a flared bell, and is played by means of valves. So that's great. So I get some text to speech. Um, one of, the, one of the things that we know from the literature is that when you link images and text together, you actually increase comprehension. And so one of the, one of the, another Google tool that I use um, and recommend to be used, if you're actually knowing, you know, looking at the meaning of a word, and I'm not too sure what that word means, and I might, so I'll get um, a student to copy that word. I'll then get them to go to, and I've just got to find it, I've get them to bookmark Google Images. Google Images becomes one of their primary dictionary tools because all they have to do is paste in the word that, they, that they're looking for, do a search, and they get an image. And they get the definition straight there. And whether you're Welsh, whether you're from Victoria, doesn't matter where you're from, that's, you get immediate information. That's what warning means. Oh, I know what it means. Um, if I go back into my... my um, my Word doc, that, uh, my Google doc that I was using, um, and I've got that word there, the same, I highlighted those words. In my read and write for Google toolbar, 
we've actually incorporated a picture dictionary to actually incorporate this this concept into that. So I press on picture dictionary, feature on my toolbar, and up comes an image straight away. So that's actually built into my into my toolbar as well. What it will also do for me, I can go through and highlight a few of the words that I need to additional support on. I'll just highlight another one. And I have another tool on my toolbar called the vocabulary tool. If I click on it, it will now take the three words that I've highlighted. It will open those, uh, open that into a new doc. Let's give it a second. Here it comes, waiting patiently. It's now generating a new doc. And in the new doc that's about to generate, it will take those three words that I've highlighted, as many words as I wanted, put them into a table. In the first column, it will have the word. In the second column, it will give me the meaning for the word. And in the third column, it will give me the symbol for the word. And it's a great tool that I can use as a teacher to support vocab, but also I can have my students can use that tool, that tool as well. So that's using, um, that's, su that's supporting um, some comprehension for using things like the Google Dictionary and the, and the dictionary and the picture dictionary and read and write for Google. Often I kind of also think, you know, I've sent the students to this website and I wonder, you know, they're there reading that website and I've got a year nine class and some of the, the students in my class are reading at a year four and year five level. I often wonder what the reading age of that, of that website is and whether I'm actually setting them up for failure by actually going to a website that's actually it's going to be too difficult for them to read. So I like to find out what the reading age, get some indication. So what I can do is, is copy the, the URL for that website. I go to a, a, a web, another website that I, that I use called readability-score.com. I can click on the URL t um, tab, paste in the website that I'm currently reading and press calculate score. It will look at that website and, and that calculate and really look at it and give me a whole bunch of data, including an average grade level for that for that website. So I can see that website that, that we're reading currently is at a year nine level, a grade level. level. This is um, this is based on the U US education system, so it's not precisely exact for it, anybody outside of the US, but it gives you a ballpark figure. You know, we should be looking at about a grade eight level that's kind of universal for most people to be able to be able to read. So that's using um, things like um, uh, readability dash score, and there's also um, uh, there's also another website called rewordify.com, that also provides that kind of data, and there's, and there's lots of others as well. But just a couple that I, that, that I think are really good to use. But what about when you actually can't get, um, you know, you've actually got a document and you actually want to get it onto your computer you, or, and, and you actually don't have, you have a handout and you actually would like, or you have a, a, a PDF document that you want to get into um, a Google Doc and you want to be able to OCR, use op, uh, optical character recognition to, um, to get that in. It's into your, into your uh, Google Drive as an example. So there's a couple of things we can do. If I go into my Google Drive, I've got um, I've got a um, a PDF here that uh, about elephants, and I would love to actually have that PDF as a Google Doc. Um, so when it's a Google Doc, I can actually manipulate it and use it. If I just had my uh, PDF sitting there and I do a right hand click on that and go open with, I can open it straight away with Google Docs. And what Google Docs will do, Google Docs will actually use OCR take the PDF, put it into the Google Doc, and then take the text out of the PDF and actually then put it into my Google Doc. So that's the original PDF on the screen. And as I scroll down, it's now taken the, it's taken the text from the PDF. And now, as you can see, I've got it here and I can now manipulate and use that text. So I've actually, Google Docs actually has OCR embedded in it. Fantastic. Sometimes though, I actually, um, want to do more than that. I actually don't want to take the text out of the PDF or out of the image. I actually want to use it as an image and I want to be able to um, interact and annotate the image itself. And I actually might not even have a PDF. I might have a hard copy. And I want to be able to say, take a photo. I can take a photo with my smartphone and upload it into my Google Drive. And, and what, I, what I can use is an extension, uh, is an app, sorry, called Snapverter. Um, 
Snapbird is an app where I can take a photo of a, of say for instance, I took a photo of um, of a worksheet on my smartphone. I put it into Snapbird on my in Google Drive. Google Drive, uh, Snapbird automatically converted that image into a PDF. Here it is. It's taken the image, turned it into a PDF. And I can now open that PDF with Read and Write for Google. So I've taken a, 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 a picture of a works of a of a page of a book or a, a handout. It's converted it into a, into a PDF. And Read and Write for Google now has put a new toolbar in that PDF. And if I want to read this image now, I click on my click and speak, and African elephants are larger and have bigger ears. Thing. So, which means that they I are well, grazers. That. Which means I can actually now um, have. I can be. I could be. A, it could be an assessment task. It could be. A, it could be where I actually have to. Um, uh, it could be a, a handout I'm using in my classroom. The other thing I can do with turning that off, also I can now annotate that as well. An example. And I can also read that back to make sure it looks okay. Elephant. Fantastic. Go okay, click. And so now I can actually move around and I can be annotating my, my PDF as well using my toolbar from Read and Write for Google. It's also got a an annotation toolbar like a sticky note, whoops, that I can write more extensive notes in it as well. Okay, so that's um, just two examples of using OCR, both OCR that's within Google Docs and also the app called uh, the uh, Google app called Snapfurter. Okay, Greg, I've got a couple of questions for you. If that's okay, that's fine. Awesome. So, um, Gay asks. I'll, I'll do this one first. Uh, I've got two questions. Gay asks about um, does the Google Docs OCR converter option is it available on the iPad version? Do you know? No, it's, it's not, but on an iPad, you actually have other apps that will do the same thing. There's a couple. There's one called Prismo, P-R-I-Z-M-O, and it's an OCR app that's it's actually fantastic. It's about, I don't know, it's about 10 or $12, but it will do the same thing on your device. Um, the thing about uh, using OCR on a device is that the critical factor is that the camera on your device, the better the camera, the better the OCR because the better the image, um, but yeah. It, and it's the same on an Android tablet. There are various um, apps on an Android tablet will also do OCR as well. Awesome. Thank you. So um, thanks for that question, Gay. I've got two, a comment and a question from Claire. Claire says that she is so sold on the annotations on OCR. Thanks. That's, that's cool. We're glad you, you've enjoyed that one and you've learned that. Um, and she does have a question. Now, I've got a feeling you might be answering this shortly, but I'll ask it now, and then you can certainly put it, you can park it. Um, Claire says, I am keen to find quick ways for younger children to learn the power of the written word reaching an audience. So what about speech to text for younger children or those needing support? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to um, have a look at speech to text in a moment what, um, and we'll talk about that and I'll also talk about um, just some of the um, considerations you need to, you need to, you need to, you need to encounter before you actually provide um, speech to text for particularly for younger children. So I'll get, I'll get there, Claire. But before I do, if, if there's no other questions at the moment, Chris. Yeah, good go, good go. Um, it, it is one of the issues that students who struggle have is that okay. So we're, we've got the screen reading back, and we've kind of got we've got now uh, the old handouts now being OCR'd, and it's on my it's on, up on my screen, and it's being read, and I'm annotating, and that's fantastic. But one of the encounters that our kids in, that have is the issue of cognitive load, in particular working memory. Working memory is that is that idea that um, students in school, uh, and not not just short term memory, your working memory. They have it. Um, we know from from the research that a young student, say in lower primary, um, can actually store between two and three items in a working memory at a time, and anything over that over that they actually get overloaded. As we get older into secondary school, it becomes four, four to five, six. And by the time we get to the age of 29, they say, we get to a maximum of being able to store about seven items in our working memory. 
But after 29, I'm afraid, folks, it's all downhill after that, and you get down to back, back to about four. But, but really what it is is that we do overload our students too much, and we do give them too much information too quickly, and we don't consider that we actually um, have to think about their working memory. And one, there's a whole bunch of apps that let us do that and just kind of let our students focus on what they have to do and simplify the environment so they can get on with the business of, of, of learning. Just the text-to-speech is a good example because with text-to-speech, what you're doing for a student is you're allowing them to, defer, when they're interacting with that text the first time, they, they can actually not worry about decoding and just get meaning from text. They can go back and decode later on, but at the moment they're just getting meaning from text, they're understanding what they're going to be reading. But there's a, lot, a whole lot of other ways that we, that we can actually help them with working memory and cognitive cognitive load. If I go back to this uh, this website here, um, the problem with this the website, uh, this one particular one, it's busy. You know, there's lots of information here. You know, and which part do I read? And 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 where do I? And all of a sudden, I'm pressed on something about the Kardashians, and all of a sudden, I'm reading about the Kardashians, and and I don't know how I got there. And it's just you know too many distractors. There's a couple of really great extensions that can help. One of them is called Clearly, and it's a it's an extension that um, is kind of linked in if you have an Evernote account. And when I press on Clearly, it will clean up that web that web page for me and just give me the main content from the web page to read. Um, I can then um, say that that um, that that new clean format in my Evernote account if I wished. That's called Clearly. Another a website, another uh, extension that you can use is called Readability. When I press on that extension, I can go Read Now, and it will also clean up that web page for me, and just and often just take take out all the images as well, and just give me the text the text to read. Um, what I can also do, I can go back to the original page. I can also um, click on that extension at this time and not read now, but read later. And I can go in and I can say, um, uh, give it a tag. I can say, add that and done. And now I've actually stored that for later on. I can come back, I can uh, look at that again without actually having to go through the whole process. And when, if I just click on readability again and, and click on my website, it takes me to my, I've logged into my readability account and there it is storing the different websites I've been actually reading and saving. And I can come back and go, oh, what was that website about? Orangutangs, I open it up, and it goes straight there in, in the clean format straight away. So this is a way of actually just reducing the clutter that's on the screen for, for students. I just want to go back to, uh, to there. That's right. Um, now, of course, um, as you would gather, Read and Write for Google also has a has an has a tool on the toolbar that helps with um, with simplifying a page, and it's called the Simplify um, feature, Simplify Page feature. I click on it on my toolbar; it does the same thing. It simplifies the page, takes all the clutter away, and just gives me the main content from the page. But it has a couple of other cool features in it as well. What it also do it allows me to change the contrast of the page. I can change from black on white to white on black, or blue on yellow and yellow on blue. So I can actually change the way the page looks. And the other thing I can do, I can, just move the toolbar up there, I can also summarize the page. So I click on the minus sign, and it auto summarizes the page, and I can summarize the page down to one or two paragraphs, which is a great feature for um, particularly older students who are doing lots of research. They might need to go to 10 different websites for a particular research project. They, they're daunted by the amount of reading they have to do. This is a really quick way for them to visit each website and get the main content from the website to, to know what, what they have to come back to, if that's a good website or not a good website to read. And of course, they can just put their cursor, they can just click there, sorry, just click on there, and it will read it back to them using their toolbar. The largest well, land mammal on Earth. As well. Okay, so I'm looking at the time, Chris. We've got about... 15, 20 minutes. This is too much. It's too much to share. Um, th there's a couple of other. If I just show you this, I'm not going to. Um, just a couple on that screen there. Underneath, you see clearly and readability. I've got listed there. 
uh, Focus and, and Visor, they're two extensions that let you um, shade the screen and only highlight the section that you're reading. So it actually is a, it, it's a, um, it's a, a, a screen shading feature, um, screen masking feature that's for students so they can really focus on the text that they're reading. Beeline Reader is a, an extension that will turn the text on your, on your screen. Um, each line will be a different color and it'll be graduated. So it lets you, let your eye go along the line and, and support your movement as you're reading your, uh, your eye movement along the line. Um, a couple of others there. One tab is one of my favorites. I, I start to get crazy with tabs. I've got so many tabs open and, and our students do the same thing. I don't know which tab is open and I don't, and all of a sudden they start playing music and I don't know where I'm at. One tab just lets me really quickly, when I'm getting too cluttered, too much information on the screen, I press one tab. It takes all my tabs that are open and takes them off, to, off across my bar and gives me a list that I can actually look at. I can also um, share that list as well. So it's a really good tool for teachers to actually get a whole list of tabs they want to share with the student and just go share as a web page. Or I can bring them back. So I and, and every day I can be having a new bunch of tabs I've got open and then it'll it'll keep a history for me. And I'll just go restore all and those tabs will come back. So just a really quick way of um, reducing that visual clutter that lots of students and, and me and probably you get by having this so many tabs tabs open. Now I just have to wait for it to um to load up. Um, <laughs> So there is a useful uh, tool in Chrome, which is if your tab is playing a noise and you don't know which one it is, it has a little, it has a little um, audio sign on it. Um, I do have a quick question while you're waiting for those to load up, Greg, if that's okay. Yeah, that's all right, Chris. It's called Mute Tab is the other one. The little extension lets you go and close that noise down. So it's called Mute Tab that I use to find the, find the tab that's making all that noise. Yes, Chris, question. <laughs> the um, just a quick one is: Does the OCR work on a photo of handwriting from the board? No. So and so OCR um, handwritings are really difficult. If the handwriting's really neat and really consistently neat, it may work. But um, the OCR that we're using in this kind of environment is really not powerful enough to OCR handwriting, and um, it's really it's kind of. And that's a um, lots of teachers um, and instructors handwrite on whiteboards, and it's it's a problem because you can't you can't OCR that you can't take a photo of that whiteboard and turn it into text, and um, that's a consideration I think you know um, of, of what we what we do. Um, just uh, one, just in terms of that noise, it reminded me of just that noise. I was we were using um, looking at some YouTube videos for for what the, we're obviously doing elephants. Um, I chose elephants because elephants have long memories, and I thought that kind of was a tie-in to um, working memory. But um, the problem with YouTube videos using with students is again, it's this uh, distractibility, is staying focused. Um, this this is the YouTube video I want, I want to watch, but there's also all this other clutter down the side here that students can kind of you know, have you tried this? Here's some other suggestions, and the comments and some of those things. I'm not, I don't want to hang here too long because I don't know if it's appropriate or not. Might not be quite appropriate for what we we want to do. There's a um, there's a website called Safe Share, Safe uh, Share TV. Let's go into it now. And Safe Share TV allows me to do this. I'll take I'll go and take the uh, URL of that YouTube video. I'll go back to Safe Share TV and paste that in. I'll ask it to generate a safe link. It's now generating a link. It's now going to create a link for me that I can share with my students. Here it comes, I hope. And what it will do, it will generate a link. Uh, it's not going to do it for me. I haven't used it on this. Oh, here we go. Good, thank you. So it's generated a link. I can actually now, uh, I can also customize the video I'm going to, as well, I can actually I can actually trim the video. I can do a bit of editing, but if I'm happy with it, way it looks, I take me to Safe Share View. You can see on my up in the URL and the address bar. That's my new web address for this Benny video. Africa poaches are definitely populations. 
but here in South Africa. So now the students get the video and everything else is blacked out except the video that they need to be looking at as well. So it's a great tool, Safe Share TV. That's, okay. That's an awesome one. I hadn't seen that, Greg. Thanks for sharing. Um, just a quick comment for you. Um, Claire says she absolutely loves OneTab, but you have just changed her life so that she can share those lists with classes. So, so well done on changing her life. That's fantastic. That's, that's, well, it, it's, it is great because you can actually go in and generate a whole, uh, a whole list of websites that you want a student to be able students to, to, uh, to use for a research project, for example, and use them using OneTab. Okay. Mm -hmm. In one tab as well, you can lock groups, so you can create a group and you can lock it and give it a title. So I have all French newspapers, for example, they're locked yep. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a group like that as well. So it's a really, really powerful tool beyond just closing that tab. So, so thanks, Claire, for um, your enthusiasm around that. Really great to hear. I'll let you keep going, mate. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. Um, so really what we're talking about is, uh, and text-to-speech is, is is part of this process of reducing cognitive load, of actually considering the working memory that student issues that students has. We, what we're doing is relieving the burden of decoding. We're focusing on the, on comprehension. We're reducing cognitive load, and we're really improving endurance and completion just by giving our students these few additional tools. Um, and then they can get on with actually writing and researching and writing. And just want to finish with this um, to look at some of these tools and. Just the, the research tool, I mean, just to have some fun with research as an example, you know, like things like, um, if I just go to, oh, I was already there. Um, I've installed um, an extension um, that's called, uh, I'll just go scroll through my extensions here. It's called Google Voice Search Hot Word. It's the name of the extension, also referred to as OK Google. And if I go back to my, um, my new tab here, you can see that I've, it's got, here, if I just go, okay, Google, elephant. According to Wikipedia, elephants are large mammals of the family Elephantida and the order Probophsidia. How fantastic is that? Some students, you know, they need to do a search for, for elephant, but they, they'll take five minutes to type in the word elephant. They can just go, okay, Google, elephant, oops, there I go, elephant, elephant foot. There they go, and so on. I won't. I won't keep playing. It's driving me crazy. Um, I'll just get rid of this. Um, I've also got another extension that I've actually installed called um, um, Google Similar Pages. And it, it, this extension, when you when you actually install it, it actually puts a little icon in your uh, address bar. When you're on a web page, if you want to quickly find, if you're doing some research, you want to quickly find similar web pages, you just click on. Google similar pages and it gives you a list, a drop down menu of websites that are similar to the website that you're currently looking at. Just another, it's just another way of giving students more tools to actually to do that research that they need, they need to do. So that was both um, um, OK Google and Google sim similar pages. If I go back to, um, oops, go back to here, of course, in, um, if I bring down my read and write for Google toolbar, I can do a couple of other things. I'm actually kind of doing this research and I can be highlighting some, reading that, having that read out aloud, and I decide I actually want to keep that so I can use my read and write for Google toolbar and highlight that. I can go down and highlight, I'll just highlight some, some text. And um, highlight that. And I can be reading that website and getting a whole bunch of text that I want to, I want to take and um, just, in terms, in terms of my reading, I can then press the collect highlights button on my toolbar, press OK. It will now take the highlights that I've actually, I have, put them into a new Google Doc, and also give me the actual link that I got those highlights from. So well, I'm, cause what you'll often find is that, is that students will go and, and gather inf data from a whole bunch of websites, but they forgot where they got the data from. This automatically saves your data and actually gives you a direct link to where you got that data from. If I if I go back to uh, my my Google Doc that I was using before, um, I might even thought oh, I got this. I was doing some work and I got this from a website and I forgot which website I got it from. I can go. I'll just pull up that for a minute. I can go to my tools in Google Docs. Go to research. It's actually already, because I had my cursor on elephant, it's already found um, 
it's done a research, it's done a search for elephant, and I, oh, that's right. Was that the website I was using? Ah, that's the website I was using to do my research on. It's actually found the, the right website. So what I can simply do is go site. I'll just put my cursor at the end of that word. I can go site. It now will actually cite that and put a footnote, um, a, a citation at the bottom of my page. Fantastic. So just another tool that's actually built into, into uh, your Google Doc. Um, in in terms of um, a couple of other research tools that are really uh, Google Scholar it is um, a, a great alternative search engine that actually lets you find um, uh, peer review and um, and academic um, papers and books and, and journal articles. Um, it also has now an extension for in in um, in, in for Chrome, and EasyBib is another uh, um, research extension. That lets you uh, find um, reference references and actually will cite them for you in the in the correct um, format as well. Um, but I just want to because we're running out of time. I just want to just quick quickly finish with writing, and and get back to this uh, the qu question particularly around um, speech to text. I've been I've been using um, my GAIF environment. I've been using Google Chrome and. And um, I've been using my uh, read and write for, for Google toolbar, for instance, reading the screen, getting information read back to me. I've been uh, reducing clutter. I've been helping. I've been kind of working on my um, working memory issues and not getting overloaded. I've been doing research, but coming to actually write now, I need to write what I, what I need to write. And the problem is that, that it's, it can be so daunting that I'll actually not even attempt it. And in fact, the, some of the work from John Hattie indicates that for, for lots of our students, avoiding failure is a stronger motivation than obtaining a, a positive success or reward. And the writing can be so difficult, I just won't even venture down that path. So we need to give them some accommodations that will actually support them in, in that writing process. And one of the one of those can be just the simple thing of, well not a simple thing, but I'll just get rid of this, of using word prediction as a writing tool. I'll go Great. back to my, yep. So you've, you've got you've got a good 10 minutes left. I'm happy for that to go on. There's some fantastic okay. stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Chris. I, I, um, so word prediction. So I've, um, I've, I want to start writing about, an, about in this doc. I might read and write for Google toolbar. When I'm in, in a Google doc, it brings up a I can click on a uh, on the word prediction feature on my toolbar, and you can see now on the screen that I can start to type. And as I start to type, it starts to predict what the what the word may be. And I can see here, I can hover over the different words. And I want to write the the elephant is a large mammal as an, as an example. And is that the this? No, that the. And so I start to type. And then it automatically starts to predict the, the next word, and it's predicting grammatically. But I want to write the word elephant, and um, and I start to kind of I'm a bit of an inventive speller. It's even actually finding my inventive spelling. It's actually helping me go the elephant. Elephant. That's it. That's the one I want, and it starts to predict the next word, and I know it's going to be in this case is. So it's just a word prediction gives gives the students a writing frame in which to actually support their writing. Sometimes they um, they might need more or less words on their word prediction feature. So if I just go back, I'm on my toolbar, now I'm going over to the settings and go to prediction. I can I can actually have between three and four results on the screen for those the students are typing. So for some students, I want to have them have lots of words available and other students less words available depending on individual student needs. Um, one of the things that I that I could do with um, as students are kind of using word prediction but I need to give them some vocab as well. So one of the things I can do is um, I could go back to my doing some re research on elephants. I'll just get rid of this toolbar here and I've got an extension called Word Cloud Website Preview. When I click on that, 
it generates a word cloud on that extension on whatever web page I'm on. And then using that word, that, um, that word cloud, I can then go into open on a page and I can then use that and I can take a screenshot of that. I can use that as a, um, as a word cloud for the students to, to, to have. And they can see that if I'm going to be start writing about elephants, I, I can see that the vocab that's being used on that web page in the, in the larger the word, obviously the more often that word was used. So I can see which words I need to be, I need to be using. Um, that's an extension. But if I'm back into my, into my Google doc, one of the areas in Google Docs that people don't explore enough is the add-ons. And add-ons is a, it's a whole another little shopping center in there that we don't even actually explore too often because we don't even know it's there. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things in there, in there. And one of them is a thing called Cloud Tag Generator. And when I just click on that, And it's, it will generate a, a cloud for me, and then I can be using that to to use to actually support me in my, in, in my writing as a, as a word bank as well. The add-ons um, to get an add-on, you just go to add-ons in your Google Doc. You go get add-ons, and it takes you to the um, to the Chrome store for add-ons. And then you can just if I just put, I'll put in text help as an example. And it can show you what what's available. Hey, and look, um, Textop actually provides a free add-on called Textop Study Skills, and it's it's. Um, if I bring it up, I'll just show you. Let's replace that. It's the same. It gives you those highlighting tools that you can collect your highlights and um, and uh, similar to what I did in the in that web page before. That's a free um, a free add-on. Now, someone was asking as I'm writing here about speech recognition or, or speech to text. Um, Read and write for Google toolbar has speech recognition. It's one of the it's one of the tools on the toolbar. Um, I click, put my cursor there. I press the the speech input feature. The elephant is a large African animal. And that's just using my microphone on my computer. I'm not using any other special microphone. I, I haven't trained that voice. It's just worked. Um, a couple of things though about about speech recognition. What what, what do we know about speech recognition? We we know there's a there's three or four really uh, really important criteria that you need to consider before a student uses speech recognition. The first one is their age. It's really important. It's a maturation issue. You really shouldn't be introducing speech recognition to a student really until they're in middle to upper primary. Young students really, it's not about them. Um, they're still in the business of learning to write and, and we really, really shouldn't be introducing speech recognition for large scale uh, inputting text into a screen, into a computer or a device. Um, the second thing is that um, it, you get a much better result if you actually have a noise cancelling microphone. So if I was to use a noise cancelling microphone, I'd have a really much higher rate of success. I would have very, very few errors. The third, the third issue is that you need to be able to um, think about, you, you need to be able to form, the process involves you forming uh, a, a group of words or a sentence in, in, in your head in advance, then dicta dictating those to the machine then watching them come up on the screen, and if there is an error, going back and making it, making a correction. So that's quite a cognitively loaded process. And so another prerequisite for speech recognition is really literacy skills. And often students who struggle with writing speech recognition is not always the best option. But there are cases when it's a really great option for, um, for if I go back to here, for students who um, say English is not their first language, or for students who, uh, for spelling, for instance, so I'm um, writing a sentence here, and the um, elef, elef, elephant was grey, 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 yeah, grey. Okay, I got that. And purple, purple, purple. And you kind of 
I don't know how to spell purple. And you know, when you're kind of some words, you don't even know what this beginning sound is. So you can't even look it up in the dictionary. Purple, how do I spell purple? Turn on my speech input. Purple. There we go, I just spelled purple. So often I'll use a speech, speech recognition as a tool for some students just to get the odd word out that they actually need, you know, need, need a support with spelling. If you don't actually have read and write for Google, uh, extension on your on your uh, in Chrome, that's okay. You can actually go to add-ons in your Google Doc, and you actually have speech recognition as a free add-on as well. And you just press start. Oh, I need to. I need to. This is a new machine, so I just need to. We watch me going through the process of installing speech recognition. There we go. Now, good to go. Thank you. Now I'll go and start. This is a free add-on that, that allows you to you know, load itself up. I hope. Here it comes. Um, the first time it takes a bit of time, obviously, because it has to install. But now it'll be there. It'll be there for good. I can actually go in here. I can choose the language. So I've got a whole bunch of languages that I can choose for input. And um, and and then within, within, within a particular language, I've got a particular dialect or location. So for English, I've got a number of different. Um, so I would obviously choose Australian because it would need to recognise my voice. And I just press start. The elephant is a large African animal, full stop. Oh, hang on, sorry. I've got to, I'm, I have to allow the microphone. I've just all part of the process, sorry. So I'll do it again. The elephant is a large African animal. And it said so do it again because I was talking before I hit the button but anyway you get the idea but it's a great tool but it's a tool we actually have to um, we have to be cautious on the handout I have a blog post that I wrote uh, about um, how you how you might consider using speech recognition with, with students and it also includes a couple of protocols you can use to do an assessment to see whether a student is actually a speech someone who actually speech recognition is a is a tool that you might want to use with them um, Oh, and just um, the the last one, screen screencastify, is something that I've only just discovered in the last month or so, and it is the coolest thing for for me as a teacher to provide content to my students, but for my students, to use it as a writing tool um, because what it does, it it, it's a, it generates a video, and it's a, a tool that um, that I think we need to have universal. Universal design for learning says to us there needs to be multiple ways that students can ex act and express what they know. Why is it they always have to just use text? Why can't we use video as a and we and we could have done a whole bunch of stuff around video, but just in terms of screencasting, um, I'll show you. I'm on a website or a student on a website, and they need to do a report about this website and about what they discovered on this website using the Screencastify extension. They click on that. They decide, they choose their microphone, they choose what, what video they're going to use, or no video at all, but um, I'm going to video myself from the bottom of the screen. I press start record. Now what it's doing is actually taking a screencast of my screen and recording whatever I'm saying and whatever I'm doing. And I've got, a, I've got some tools down here. I'll choose the pen. And if I was a student, I could say, uh, you know, I could be describing what I read. I read. I made sure that I read this um, this this tab, and it, it told me about so and so and so and so. And on the map, I discovered that many um, elephants live in the Sudan. And some live in in Thailand, but none live in the wild in Australia, and so on. And I could be giving uh, I can I can be telling you what I know about this particular website and what I've learned from that website. When I'm finished, I'll just press stop record recording. It now yeah. it's actually taking a screen pass of my screen and recording whatever I'm saying and whatever I'm doing. And I, 
and there's the video that it's automatically recorded and i've actually got myself down the bottom of the screen um but i could do that i could actually um for an assessment task rather than just questions what the assessment task is or give them um a printed a printed worksheet i could actually give them a quick video and tell them what they have to do on a particular website as an assessment task so that's that's um that's a fantastic um um uh, extension that I've recently, and I'm sure Chris has known about it for years, but I've only just discovered it recently, and it's a, it's a great tool, particularly for struggling students. Okay. Absolutely fantastic, Greg. Seriously, I'm not just saying this because we're friends. I've learned so much in that, absolutely brilliant and, and so applicable. And just, you know, to, to, to tell you that it's not just me, we've got Claire, who I checked on our list, and Claire's actually from Otago in New Zealand. And Claire is, um, she said, I'm sorry, but if my team was online right now, they'd be so excited about Safe Share for YouTube. Um, she also says that she's getting heaps from this webinar for, our, for her new school. Many thanks, particularly taking away footnotes and other research tools. She appreciates you sharing the add-on process. Lots of new learning and thoughts about pedagogy, and she's already rethinking speech to text. So many thanks. Thank you, Claire, for, for joining us. And we know, we appreciate it. I think it's 8, 9, 10, 10 o'clock in New Zealand. So uh, thank you so much for joining joining us. Um, I'm just going to very quickly share my screen just to show you a couple of um, important. Oh, oh, Chris, before you do that, this yeah. is the student. That, this is the students. Uh, probably we're going to mess it up, but I forgot to share my screen. And this is the uh, once two days after the student was given accommodation, some some support, some te technology tools to support the literacy need. This was their output two days later. So it just it's just That's an example amazing. of yeah it just it just phenomenal okay absolutely Back wonderful. To you, Greg. thank you Greg um, just very very quickly just going to um, share my screen now ooh it's kind of weird um so a couple of things firstly because you guys have registered you will get access to this um, document so this document is the um, handout from Greg which is wonderful absolutely jam-packed full of links to not just to some of the technologies that he's shown tonight but also to the research etc but very importantly if you do wish to connect with um greg there is some contact details at the end he's got a great blog and a really worth uh following on google plus and on twitter and obviously drop him an email at text help if you want to connect and maybe uh get some support from from greg a little bit more um and also just to flag up that this is now the one, two, three, fourth webinar that we've run in the next practice series. So we started off looking at SAMA and then we started looking at um, communities and uh, uh, inquiry. And then last, I think two weeks ago, I ran one specific on language learning. And I didn't actually show Read and Write for Google because I did, which is a wonderful tool, not just for literacy, but also for, for learning a second or a third language. Um, because I did know that we'd have Greg here and Greg has, has done a wonderful job of taking us through those tools. So. Um, yeah, make sure that you, if you haven't, if you're watching this and you haven't registered and you'd like the um, handout, please register on this form. Um, we do have another two webinars coming up on the 9th of September at 7 o'clock um, Australia Eastern Standard Time. We have Dr. Rebecca Vivian, who is um, a researcher and post, post doc, is that right? Um, she's a, a researcher particularly into um, ICT but actually education in um, coding and some wonderful um, ways to get kids to code. So please um, you know, register here, fill in the form and join us for this one again. You know, if you fill in you can't make it, it's not, too, it's not the end of the world, you will get the video and uh, the handout. So definitely you know, if you're interested in getting kids coding, then please uh, register for this one. And then the uh, final one for this quarter on the 17th of September is we have Marissa Peters and Sarah Anderson who are two wonderful um, Google certified educators and trainers who are going to look specifically around uh, examples from the primary school um, and looking at building student collaboration around Google Docs, but things around learning menus, which is a really interesting uh, concept. So have a little read about what they're gonna uh, talk about. And again, you can register here. Um, I'm just gonna stop screen sharing now. Um, again, I just want to put out my heartfelt thanks to um, Greg for his time and his expertise. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, to to spend the evening with them. I'm now going to go and have some uh, food, I think. Have you had your dinner yet, Greg? I might go and do the same thing, Chris. <laughs> sounds, sounds good. But just before you do go, sorry, Greg, I do have um, tons of new comments on here for you. 
Thanks, guys. Will this recording be available later? Yes, Mark, we will send you the recording with your certificate and the handout from Greg. Um, just a great update. As always, I continue to learn so much from you, Greg. That's from Gay Cross. That's really lovely. Um, Stella, Stella is very informed of now to start trying it out. Absolutely, Stella. Barbara, wonderful thanks. And Rebecca, um, can't wait to see to share these tips with my colleagues in my new learning support position. Think of doing it. Thinking of doing a tip of the day, which is a great idea. Now, is that my, is that Rebecca, my friend from yeah from Singapore? Hi, Rebecca. Good to see you. Um, okay, so once again, Greg, thank you so much. Um, I'll speak to you soon, uh, but I'm going to now stop the broadcast. Uh, you guys, don't forget to register for, register for the rest of our next practice seminars, webinars, uh, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. See you, everybody. Bye.